Welcome, Boulder Church. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the service. Lord, I find you in the seeking. Lord, I find you in the doubt. And to know you is to love you And to know so little else I need you Oh, how I need you Oh, how I need you Oh, how I need you find you in the morning, Lord, I see you every day. Let my life be for your glory, woven in your friends of grace. I need you, oh, how I need you. How I need you Oh, oh, oh Oh, oh, I will go where you shine, break the dawn, crack the skies, make the way bright before me in your light. I will find all I need, all I need is you. Light, glorious light, I will go where you shine, break the dawn, crack the skies, make the way bright before me in your light. I will find all I need, all I need is you. Oh, light, glorious light, I will go where you shine. Break the dawn, crack the sky, make the way bright before me in your light. I will find all I need, all I need is you. Oh, oh, how I need Oh, how I need you. 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 How I need you Is, is it going? I think it's going. All right. Um, hi. Yeah, I'm Ted. And today I'm going to answer some fan emails. I have emails because I spend lots of time emailing. And I write stuff. And then people write back. And I answer their questions. Because I'm Ted. Right. So, email number one. Let me see. Hold on. 
Okay. Here it is. It says, Dear Ted, I don't like walnuts. Their shells are too hard for me to eat. What should I do? Sincerely, Kevin. Um. Hmm. Wait, I have food questions. I like food questions because I, I, I like foods. I like the foods. Do you, do you like? Do you like the foods? I like the foods. But I think I know what's going on here. I believe the problem is that you're not supposed to eat the shells. I'm pretty sure they are just way too hard. You could break a tooth. Or maybe you are awesome enough to actually chomp through a shell into pieces. But then on those sharp pieces, they get stuck in your throat. And then the only way to get them out is to have somebody with like two foot long tweezers and a flashlight in there and a grumpy nurse. And then a bald guy who sat in the corner and laughed at me the whole time. I mean, a bald guy who just sat in the corner and laughed at whoever it was the whole time because it wasn't me that one time. So, the secret to having the correct relationship with walnuts is that you have to get past the walnut shell. Walnuts are like that one grumpy old guy who shows up at Thanksgiving every year. Yeah. Um, he's cranky and always tells you um, and yells at you when you eat the cranberry off his plate. That guy. But, if you take some time and you get to know him a little bit, and you talk to him for a while, you find out he's kind of cool, and you get past that unpleasant exterior, and then he spends the rest of the night, <clears throat> excuse me, he spends the rest of the night telling you about cats and Ronald Reagan and that cheese that smells like garbage trucks. So, yeah, in conclusion, don't eat the shell, Eat the dyslexical, the, the dis, the dispensable, you know, that's not right either. The delective, the tasty part inside. There you go. Eat the tasty nut inside. Okay. Uh, let me find the next email. Hold on. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> Dearest Ted, puppies or baby iguanas? Love, Erica. Mm. Yes, the answer is yes. See, they are both mucho tiny. They're like this big, little tiny little things. And while they may look super different, they are both totes adorbs. I love them both so much. <laughs> but the thing is, you can't get caught up on the fact that they're different. Because different isn't bad. Um, different can be pretty cool. Look at me. I'm a fake long I'm a fake monkey named Ted. And I am super awesome. That was my awesome pose. When I do that, it means awesome things are happening. Okay. All right. Was that clear? I think that was clear. All right, let me get to the last one. I got one more of these to do. Here we go. Email number three. Excuse me? I'm answering my fan emails. I'm busy. Shh. I'm on camera. All right, email number three, here it is. Mr. Ted, yeah, is that really official? I'm huh? like, Mr. Ted, all right. Every time I eat the banana peel with the banana, it tastes weird. And your friend, Kaylee. Um, so I'm not sure there was a question there. Um, 
But if I may offer my super extra wise advice, you may want to stop eating the banana peel. Even I don't eat the banana peel. I do not do that. Every time I do that, I throw up in the bald one's shoes. I am weirdly consistent that way. And that's not the tasty important part. It's the part inside that's quite debilitating. Wait. That's not the right one. Delineating. Nope, that's, that's not it either. Delecti delectable. Delecta delectable. It's delectable. It's the, the, it's the one. The inside is super tasty. You know, I think I have picked up on something here. I feel like maybe there's a bigger, more important thing here. I feel like maybe, just maybe, these emails aren't so much about the foods and the tiny animals. Tiny animals. Maybe it's about the things that are different and being way too focused on the things that are outside and the things that are not the same. And maybe we should be a bit more focused on what's inside and what's, what's the awesome parts, which is the things on the insides. Maybe we should pay more attention there and enjoy that instead. What do you think? Yeah, that's what I think. All right, well, I'm out of emails for today. So, I must go find one of the bald one shoes because I ate some banana peel earlier today and it's about that time. All right, catch you later. Bye-bye. Good morning, Boulder Church family. We are gonna sing a song this morning that reminds us of a journey from Egypt to Canaan. It goes like this. King of kings, Lord of lords, glory, alleluia. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, alleluia. Jesus, the Prince of peace, glory, alleluia. Jesus, the Prince of peace, glory, alleluia. Let's do that a little faster. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, alleluia. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, alleluia. Jesus, the Prince of peace, glory, alleluia. Jesus, the Prince of peace, glory, Alle a little faster, King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, Alleluia. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, Alleluia. Jesus, the Prince of peace, glory, Alleluia. Jesus, the Prince of peace, glory, Alleluia. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath to everybody, no matter where you are. You may be hiking out in the great outdoors. It's gonna be hot, so hopefully you have your water and you will check in with us later after you get back. Those of you who are at home in your jammies or eating your breakfast or whatever, we welcome you and are happy that you are with us. We only have two announcements this morning. Our search committee has been formed and has compiled a list of candidates for senior pastor. We would love to have your input, so please submit any suggestions or nominations this week at hello at boulder.church. We welcome your feedback. Announcement number two. Also, we will be hosting a Boulder Church Town Hall session this coming Sunday at 5 p.m. It will be held on Zoom and the link will be in this week's bulletin. We would like as many people as possible to tune in so that we can update you on a variety of things happening within our church community. If you have any specific questions you would like answered regarding finances, staffing, or anything else, please send them to, again, hello at boulder.church. Thank you and hope we'll see you there. We're also happy that some of our members are away on vacation or 
they are out with spending really fun time with their families. We hope all of them are safe no matter where they are or what they're doing and will come back refreshed and renewed. We have two specific prayer requests this week. Several members of our congregation are struggling with COVID-19. So please pray for them that they get well soon. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for being with all of us today, wherever we are. Be especially with those who are struggling with the COVID-19 and we pray for their um, quick recovery. Also for any of our other members or friends or loved ones who are struggling with maybe depression, maybe loneliness, physical problems, whatever. We know that you know who they are and you will be with them. Have the Sabbath be a special blessing for all of us and to remember that we're together even when we're not together. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. Blessed be your name When the sun's shining down on me When the world's all as it should be Blessed be your name And blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering Though there's pain in the offering Blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory as a name.
with a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone and I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God From my mother's womb You have chosen me Love has called my name And I've been born again To your family Your blood flows through my veins And I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God Then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But. I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse His name. Remember to observe the Sabbath day 
by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Honor your father and mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. You must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. I decided this morning to switch it up and no longer record from the side of an active volcano, which was cool for last week and also uh, not cool because turns out you can't just stick an LED light on the floor and shoot it up at the ceiling and make that look cool without making it look hellish. But lesson learned, so I've switched the lighting and uh, we're going to continue on with the series that we're in from Egypt to Canaan. Uh, as Pastor Vanessa showed, we're going to be talking about the Ten Commandments, which for the most part are considered standard issue Christian values. If you've got these, you've got uh, a picture of God and an understanding of how to operate your own life uh, while you've got it here on earth. But one thing I think I have found to be true that I would like for us to use uh, in our picture of study today is how scripture changes based on the context you're reading it in. Based on the age you are, what you're going through, scripture can speak in ways that it hadn't before and may never well again simply because of the era that you're living in as you're reading it. And so um, I want to give a couple of, of indicators to people who may be listening. Uh, if you find yourself in a camp that thinks I'm well-versed in the Ten Commandments, I, I know what they are, I live by them, I follow them uh, exactly as they're written in Exodus, um, be ready to hear them in a different way today. Be ready to hear them in a way that maybe you haven't before simply because we're in a different time and didn't, in a different era uh, as we read them this time through. For those of you who are sick of hearing about the traditional points of Christianity, uh, hang tight. I want to say that uh, the Ten Commandments hit different when you're in the middle of a pandemic. So hang tight and see if you can stick with us. And for those of you who are new to all of this, new to Old Testament thinking, new to the historical church and where we came from, um, this is a good conversation for you to come in on because it gives you a chance to understand things then and things now in a way that uh, maybe you haven't before. And so I hope you enjoy uh, this interpretation of it all. Uh, we're going to read through what Moses has on the tablets and then we're going to rewind the clock and we're going to see if we can make sense of things the way they are now uh, in comparison to the way they were then. Um, I think we still have a lot in common with the Israelites, not just what we learned last week, but um, from that same vantage point where you could see God before, uh, there's a good chance you'll be able to see God differently from your position here now, putting yourself back in your own shoes. Um, we're going to need to talk about identity in all of this and your identity and more importantly what your identity is in light of a very important word we're going to stop and start around, which is the word consecrate. What does it mean to be consecrated? And what is your identity in the moment in which you are consecrated to the Lord? We're going to get into all of that, but let's start this morning with a prayer. Father God, 
It's good to be in your presence, and it is good to be reading your word. Help us, guide us, walk us through this understanding of Exodus and your Ten Commandments so that we can understand what it means to be renewed by your Spirit, to be consecrated in your name, and to work in a way that makes sense to who we ought to be in light of who you are. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So like I said, uh, scripture changes with our interpretation based on where we are, but I do want to make one thing clear. I do believe that God is evergreen. I do believe that there is an identity of God and God is who he is throughout time, but maybe we change and maybe our understanding of who God is based on who we are does change. But I do believe that God is evergreen. But in our understanding of scripture, we have to somehow find a way to make it make sense to us or else we're just reading a story about some other people in some other time and why is it relevant to me and why do I need to apply it? And so in order to understand that, we have to kind of understand the identity of what God was saying then and whether or not he's saying something now. Dr. Charles Teal, um, the late great Dr. Charles Teal from La Sierra University, taught us about the prophets. And the prophets operated under two different uh, methodologies. The first one is, If you're going to be a prophet, your job is not to speak your own mind and not just speak the mind of God, but to say something specific about God to God's people. In this case, Dr. Teal always hit the word ought, how things ought to be, not how they should be, not how they could be, but how they ought to be. There's a right way for things to be, and the prophets speak into that identity. The second one is... In order to be a prophet, you have to keep one eye on scripture and one eye on the culture around you so that you can speak life into that culture and not speak over their heads or around what they're going through. You've got to make it relevant. And so using those two principles, I am going to hopefully find a way for us to uh, understand God in a new way that we might not have before. Uh, We call that present truth, the idea that God breaks into our world, and in that inbreaking, he brings with him truth that we didn't have before. Something that, because we're reading it now, because we're in this time now, God is going to bring us something new for us to explore. And I think it's a good time for us to read the Ten Commandments, especially in light of COVID-19. I have three goals for today, and these three goals are simple and complicated all at the same time. The first one... Our goal is to restore our sense of connection to God. Keep in mind the first four commandments are all about a relationship between people and to God. The second goal, to receive a connect to to revive, I'm sorry, to revive our connection to one another. The first four are about our connection to God, the last six are our connection to one another. In a time of social distancing and separation and quarantine, it seems like we can get further and further away. I'm coming to you live through a camera, which is not typical of what we do. So in reading through this section of Exodus, how can we revive our connection to one another? And the third goal is to provide a renewed understanding of the value of the word of God. We're taking a a story that would be considered old, maybe ancient, maybe out of date, but there's still value in it. And so in trying to understand our relationship to God and our relationship with one another, let's also see if we can find a renewed understanding of the value of the word of God. So let's do a quick overview. Uh, This section is, uh, we're going to mostly look at chapters 19 and 20. Uh, This section is supposed to go through chapter 24. I will leave that to all of you to read through 21 through 24. It's a great section. I just don't have the time to cover it in this sermon. But to give you a quick overview, chapter 19, group of people seven weeks after they've left Egypt find themselves in the Sinai wilderness. Moses says, we're going to stop here right at the base of this mountain. And Moses goes for a hike. He makes it up to the top of Mount Sinai. And there God tells Moses, I want you to go back down and I want you to do a couple of things for me. Number one, Remind the people of my promises and all the times in which I came through just like I said I was going to. Remind them of my promises. And then in verse 5, God creates a conditional statement. A conditional statement fits within the realm of it starts with the word if, and then there's content, and then comes a comma, and then the word then. If, blank, then blank. And if this first condition isn't met, then this second condition doesn't exist. In this case, God says, if they keep my covenant, then they will stay as my people. 
Let them know that I have come through all my promises. Let them know the conditions of my people. Moses goes down the mountain. He gets the elders together. He says, God's going to come down with some rules. You'll find out about those later. The question is, are you all in? And the elders all together, a unanimous vote, say we are all in. Just like Peter's sermon from a couple of weeks ago. If you want to be in, you got to be all in. And the Israelites decide we're all in. And the question becomes how? They don't even know what they're signing up for. And the reality is they haven't forgotten the Red Sea. They don't forget the fact that just a moment ago they were all but dead and God pulled them out of it. And so if they're with God... They're going to be okay. And so they say, whatever God says, we're going to go with. We're fine. Let's just sign on the dotted line. We'll figure it out later. So Moses goes back up the mountain. God tells Moses, go back down the mountain. Tell them they need to consecrate themselves. There's that word again, consecrate themselves in preparation for the third day. Before we get to the third day, let's slow down on the word consecrate. That word means devoting or setting apart of anything to the worship and service of God. To consecrate means to devote or set apart anything to the worship and service of God. And in this case, God is saying the thing that I want you to consecrate is yourself. And so they have three easy steps to consecration. Step number one, do your laundry. Step number two, don't go hiking. Step number three, no women. That's it. Those are the rules. The rules of engagement are very simple. Just follow those three rules, which if we leave it like that, it'll be a little confusing. Let me go through it. The, the identity of doing their laundry, washing their clothes, is the identification of baptism. And so whatever was on them, that residue of seven weeks of still fighting through their identity of I'm a slave, I'm no longer a slave. If I'm not a slave, then who do I belong to? God basically says, wash yourself clean of all of the past. You're about to walk through a threshold into something new. And that something new is being my people. And there's no space on you for the old life. Everything else will be new. The second one is attempting to create a tabernacle behavior. It's not just don't go hiking, don't go up that mountain. It's I want to start to present to you a habit or a pattern of worshiping God. They're going to start building temples. They're going to start building the tabernacle. And there's an understanding of when you come to the tabernacle, when you come to the temple, when you get to go inside, who gets to go inside, and what happens if you go past the point you're not supposed to go to. God is actually creating for them a routine they don't fully understand, but will after they've reached the promised land. And then the last one, no women, uh, is basically just a conversation on relationships. Right now, you understand relationship as two people coming together, but I want you to get into the habit of not relying on this relationship, but this relationship. And so he's turning their view from horizontal to vertical, from the humanity to the divinity of what God is. So he's changing those rules for those three reasons. Unfortunately for women, that's a tough one because... Uh, just being told no women and then Moses goes up the mountain. Tough read, but it's all about relationships. Story goes on. Three days pass and all of a sudden the smoke show starts on Mount Sinai with God and Moses up there. I don't know what it would have been like, but if ever you get the chance to do so, take a look on YouTube. Uh, search for San Diego 4th of July Fireworks 2012. My imagination fits with exactly what that was. If you don't get a chance or to give a, a, a little warm up to it, San Diego had an 18 minute fireworks show prepped and ready in 2012. They hit the button right when it was supposed to start after people had waited hours to see this show. And due to a computer glitch, they all went off at the same time. So 18 minutes condensed down to about 35 seconds of noise, fire, and light. I can only imagine. It made the ground tremble. It may have at times sounded like a loud trumpet, and it threw off a lot of smoke. So I wonder if that's not what happened on Mount Sinai or something close to it. But after the explosions, God finally pays out on this promise that I want you to keep this covenant. Now I'm going to get specific. Moses comes walking down, and we get the Ten Commandments. And so chapter 20 begins with Moses breaking down what these new rules are. And I'm just going to read them as a list to you uh, so that you can hear them, you know what they are. And I'm just going to read them 1 through 10, taking out a little bit of the language. I've broken it down to its bare bones. Rule number one, no gods before me. Rule number two, no idols. Rule number three, don't take my name in vain. Rule number four, keep my Sabbath holy. 
Rule number five, honor your parents. Rule number six, no murder. Rule number seven, no adultery. Rule number eight, no stealing. Rule number nine, no lying. And rule number 10, don't covet. Those are the rules. That's what you signed up for. You want to be my people. Follow those. Instead of going further into the chapter, I want us to start backtracking the other way. And I want us to come down the other side of this mountain into our realm and out of theirs and hope that we can understand these Ten Commandments in a different way. Because I think as we look at our current culture and we read about a, an ancient culture, I think there are ways for us to learn new things. And like I said, reading this section in a different time, in a different context, these Ten Commandments hit different. So let's see if you can walk with me. Rule number one, no gods before me. Back then, it was super important to talk about the identity of, of, of no gods before me and this god now because they lived and worked in Egypt and, and Pharaoh thought he was a god. And it was also in a pluralistic society, so they worshipped many gods. And so God was just breaking down things that go, don't worry about all of that. Just focus on me. And if you've got me, then you'll be okay. So we're bringing you out of one culture and we're working you into a different culture from his people to my people. Today, due to the coronavirus, lots of things have shifted. We've canceled everything. There's no more plays. There's no more uh, concerts. There's no more movies coming out. And societies we know it has been crippled and broken down past things that we're accustomed to. And because this life has changed, and because things have slowed and closed, it gives us the ability to rebuild kind of from scratch. And if we go from the ground up, and we start from here, then we have to wonder whether or not square one now and square one then weren't the same thing. God says, put me first. Don't put anything else before me so that you have space for other things afterwards. That's another thing, but make sure there's space for me first and build around that. And so the question becomes, when everything opened up for us, when we were allowed to go back into society, what was the first thing we built upon? And was it God? Rule number two, no idols. Before COVID, it was documented that uh, the new church gathered out in cathedrals. Or not in cathedrals, but in stadiums. Maybe you've seen this. This the idea that more people go to soccer stadiums than they do to church. Numbers drop on days in which the local team is playing. And we usually find that the, the people would go to these stadiums to watch these warriors fight against other warriors, and those warriors became icons. This year, stadiums are closed, at least to the public. Games may start, sports may re, reintroduce themselves into our society, but the fans have been replaced. In some places, you can get a cardboard cut out of yourself in your favorite seat. But for the most part, you are silent, and that doesn't mean that the stadiums are they're pumping crowd noise in so that those same warriors can get used to the sounds that they think they're supposed to hear when they do the things that we adore them for. I don't know if you heard this, but on Wednesday of this week, LSU football coach Ed Orgeron talking uh, with uh, different leaders at a meeting with Mike Pence uh, gave this quote in relation to college football coming back when uh, it is scheduled to be. Uh, Coach Orgeron said the country needs football during the coronavirus pandemic and later said that football is the lifeblood of our country. In this new world that's ready to be restarted in whatever way we the people choose, I wonder if the second commandment doesn't provide context and direction for where it should. Rule number three. Don't take my name in vain. Today, we equate that to if you stub your toe, make sure you say gosh darn it instead of the other version. But in historical context, the identity of name and vein and the use of it has to do with your breath. Because in Genesis, keep in mind, we're in Exodus, so we're not that far away from the story of Genesis. When God created humanity, he breathed life into humanity. And so everything that was within us that was our breath was the Holy Spirit, and what we breathed out and what we breathed in was only of God. So whatever you breathed in and whatever you breathed out had to be the, to the glory of God. Anything that wasn't in response to our identity of worship towards God was considered to be in vain. 
Now today we've got a couple of loopholes which are kind of interesting. Right now our breath is being restricted by a mask that we cover over ourselves and you can't exactly see what it is I'm saying or what I'm doing and so when I breathe in my anger and animosity and I breathe out my judgments that I whisper and mutter under my mouth, technically do I get away with it? Second of all, we're supposed to be socially distanced from one another and so really we're not supposed to be close enough for you to hear my thoughts and so my thoughts now are tapped out on a keyboard, now are typed out onto a touch screen. And so we've got to ask the question, if we're not actually breathing in and breathing out these words, are we exempt? Are all the hateful, judgmental comments we put onto the internet, are they outside of the boundary of God's commandment? Rule number four, keep the Sabbath. There was a time when missing church was something that people noticed because you came and worshiped corporately. But today, now you're watching this on a screen somewhere and it's harder to tell who is in the room and who isn't in the room. And uh, as we meet on our connect groups and we get to see each other, we're able to see one another, but it's not the same thing. And we've heard from you when we understand, we've heard it's cold, it's impersonal, it's different, it's worse, it's boring. It's predictable. It's hard. It's lame. And we understand that's how you feel. And those feelings are valid. And unfortunately, that validity and the truth that is in it give us the opportunity to find different ways to keep the Sabbath. And most of us believe one thing, and it's that we want to keep the Sabbath, and so that's why we go to church. But unfortunately, we've equated those things as being the same thing. If you go to church, then you're keeping the Sabbath holy. But then we have to ask the question, what happens when church gets canceled? Because it's not the same thing to keep the Sabbath holy and to go to church. As a matter of fact, you can keep the Sabbath unholy from your seat in church by doing the right things, thinking the right things, and putting your mind in the wrong place. Um, Now that church is canceled, things are a little bit differently. What happens when you can watch church on the rebroadcast because you don't have to catch it live at 930? Um, Does it change? Does it change the holiness of what we do? It can be easy to justify the things that we do when no one's watching. And in this new world, you're in charge of keeping your own Sabbath holy today. So ask yourself, are you still keeping it? And when you talk to God about it and you ask these questions of God, do you get back the signals that the things that you're doing work in the realm in which God finds to be holy? Rule number five and rule number six I'm going to put together. Honor your parents. Do not murder. The coronavirus currently has the ability to live in our systems for 14 days without symptoms. And then in that time, we are allowed to pass it on as we interact with other people. And this virus, while it's mutated, still affects people who are older and affects them more adversely, even though more people are now being affected adversely outside of that range. But our elders, when they catch the coronavirus, uh, become more problematic and the symptoms can become fatal in quicker and worse ways. And so now, Looking in light of the culture we live in today, has murder take on, taken on a different meaning? And is honor now a different responsibility? Now we have to ask the, ourselves the question, and looking at this commandment or these commandments combined, is it possible that the method to living a commandment life is found in wearing a mask? Rule number seven, no adultery. Before, when we used to go to work and there was the idea that you could find yourself sleeping with a coworker or with somebody who you met on a dating app, it was a little bit easier to find ways to do that simply because we got up, we left our house, we went somewhere else and we didn't come back until we were done. And our whereabouts in that time could give us the ability to bump into other people and allow us to hide those transgressions inside of our schedule. But under quarantine, we're inside. There was a curfew. There's social distancing. Now all of a sudden adultery, just like other relationships, is digital. And so from the privacy of your own home, you can click something with a mouse and find a picture to look at or a person to connect to. You can tap on an app and find yourself connecting with people as you swipe right. Relationships now 
can be broken within a digital system and the connections that we make online can have the power to dissolve marriages like maybe never before. You've got a dating app hidden behind a passcode or you've got a text chain in a second phone your wife doesn't know about or a private email in a mislabeled inbox that your husband isn't aware of or maybe a premium account paid for on a credit card that your spouse doesn't know about. It may not be physical contact anymore, but ask yourself this question. Are all of your relationships that are consecrated by God still above board? And it may be digital, but does that mean it's not adultery? Rule number eight, no stealing. What happens when toilet paper, flour, yeast, milk, butter, canned goods, dried beans, masks, soap, hand sanitizer, and fuel are suddenly in limited quantity? It can be easy to justify theft and to keep your family alive and keep your pantry stocked. I mean, after all, it is a pandemic. Shouldn't the rules change? But in this time and in that time, stealing is a signal of self-reliance and of self-preservation. So ask yourself, do we get a pass just because it's an emergency? Or are we still called to obey this identity of no thieving? Rule number nine, no lying. With the help of social media, misinformation spreads like wildfire. When something you put out in the world gets a share or a like, or a retweet, or suddenly there's a subreddit on the, the information you're giving, uh, be clear, the information highway does not have a bias towards truth. It gets spread no matter what it is. And because it's you that said it in your network, it may actually be treated as the gospel to those who read it. And so are we as careful with our clicks and our shares as we are with our testimony when we're told to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? Rule number 10. Don't covet. Louis C.K. Uh, says this quote, and I need to be very careful because I know I'm using a Louis C.K. quote. By using this quote, I am not saying that I agree with anything he does with his comedy, with his life, with all of the things that he is mixed up in. But I do think this quote has some value, and so I want to share it. Uh, hopefully we can get through who shared it in order to understand what was shared. The quote says this, the only time you look into somebody else's bowl is to make sure that they have enough. You never look into your neighbor's bowl to see if you have as much as they do. And so in this identity of covetousness, we have to ask the question, can you still claim to be following the commandments if you are hoarding supplies you don't need that could be used for other people? Ten commandments in total, then and now as challenging in the Sinai wilderness as they are in quarantine. Now, this updated version, you'll notice, always ended with a question, it's simply because I'm interpreting the scripture to bring it into this current context, not to say that this is exactly what God said, this is exactly what God thinks. And I want to be clear, if you don't agree with this interpretation and you believe these applications don't apply, that's okay. Uh, the idea is not for you to agree with it, but to challenge you to think about an ancient set of words that can be brought into a cultural update. Be clear, God does not mandate masks, and he does not equate athletes with stadiums and gods and churches. He didn't call out tender browsing as adultery, and he did not say hoarding is the same thing as coveting. Those are my words in order for us to help us understand the interpretation and to wrestle with what it means to not simply relegate old traditions to the past, but to bring them into the world we live in today. Let's not pretend like we've outgrown them. And if we haven't outgrown them, then maybe they need to be touched up by our reality. The commandments then and now were rules by which God thought we ought to live in order for us to know what we ought to do. By keeping an eye on these tablets and keeping an eye on the world around us, we hopefully can find a way to learn about God and ourselves in a new way, to create a new clarity to old theories. If you want to think about the book of Exodus and the section within chapter 20 as the Ten Commandments, maybe these are just simply the Ten Woke Commandments. And as you look at these interpretations, and uh, you think to yourself, you're skeptical. 
I don't think I want to look at this the same way. I actually like them in their original versions. Or maybe you take a look at this other section and you think, man, there's something to it. Maybe this is something we, we keep in mind as we move through this new paradox current life um, that it doesn't actually matter which one you take, whether you take the old or the updated. Uh, and I don't want to make that seem like old and new and new is better, but take them together. It doesn't matter which one you choose. If you want to apply them to your life and you want to take them seriously, it all starts the same way. And it starts the way Moses had uh, the people start on mission from God to consecrate yourself. You need to consecrate yourself for these things to take life in your world. To consecrate yourself means to dedicate yourself formally to a divine purpose. As the Israelites tried to consecrate themselves, they did it in three ways. For us, it could be different. Um, but the good thing is, both of us have something in common. We both have the time. The Israelites were out in the wilderness. They were seven weeks out of anything familiar, and they were left in the foot of this mountain for them to figure out what comes next. And for us, we have time as well. We're far away from society, or at least far enough away from society and our routines and the regular habits that we had to give this new interpretation or this old interpretation a chance to grow. We've been interrupted, and now we have the option of revisiting it. But to be clear, I want to make one thing perfectly clear. In order to make this point, someone may have to ask the question, yeah, but are you saying God created the coronavirus for us to have this moment? Good question. No, I do not believe God created the coronavirus. I am not saying that just like God orchestrated something in the Exodus for the people to be at this point so that they could see this thing so that Moses could come down with the tablets, God did the same thing here. I'm not saying that. I know God orchestrated what happened in the Exodus. What I'm saying is we have the opportunity based upon this situation to experience something like the Israelites simply because we have the time and the space and the opportunity. Clarity on both of those points. But... We are here, we are in the present, we are in the now, and we have the chance to start fresh. We have slowed down enough to figure out what time looks like, what we want time to be, and we want what we want to fill our time with. We have an opportunity to reevaluate our values and our priorities. And God has given these rules, these 10 commandments for a people to wrestle with in order to understand how they ought to be as they reflect their life from how God is leading them. And so while time has changed and the time between then and now has changed and people and culture have changed, the rules have not. They may have been adjusted, but the rules are exactly the same. So I leave you with this question. How will you apply them? that are washing over me are much more than I can stand and I know my boat is sinking my feet won't touch the sand when the mountain that's in front of me Seems too high for me to climb And I cannot say for certain Victory is mine Be near me, Jesus, be near Be near me, Jesus, be near prayer of my life won't you answer when you hear be near me Jesus be near when the light that I've been looking for 
seems to flicker in the night And I'm looking for an answer I just can't get it right Be near, be near me, Jesus, be near. It's the prayer of my life, won't you answer when you hear? Be near me, Jesus, be near. chaos that surrounds me makes it hard to hear your voice and I'm listening for the stillness but all I hear is noise be near me Jesus be near be near Jesus be near It's the prayer of my life Won't you answer when you hear Be near me Jesus be near It's the prayer of my life Won't you answer when you hear Be near me Jesus be near May Jesus bless you with gentleness and a heart that is tender. May Jesus bless you with the strength against evil. May Jesus bless you with compassion and care for all people. May Jesus bless you with the courage that will dare to be who you are. May Jesus bless you with openness, understanding, and respect. May Jesus bless you with the power to make Jesus all.